This is the Padua Podcast Network. Scientists have proposed many alternatives for the colonization of space, including one put forth by a physicist that involves living not on planets, but in cylindrical habitats which spin, producing centrifugal gravity. Running a Fever, episode 186, Longevity and the Population of Space. Welcome to Running a Fever. I'm Michael Davis. Do you love your life enough to make it last as long as possible? Did you know that living as long as possible had anything to do with loving your life? Well, you're in the right place if you're wondering about these things, thinking about them, or believing them. Because that's what we're all about here at Running a Fever. I'm with you from the studios of Running a Fever World Headquarters in Northwest Arkansas. And today we're talking about longevity in the population of space. One of the philosophical considerations of increased longevity is the so-called problem of overpopulation. This is controversial and has been hotly debated by zero population growth advocates like Bill Gates and his parents, as well as conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones, who proposed that An elite group wants to limit population to themselves and a sufficient number of plebeian slaves. I don't really want to get into all that, but as a philosopher, I'm very interested in the topic abstracted from the debates. So today, I'm discussing not a 10,000-foot view, but a 10,000-light-year view of proliferation of the human species. The popular debates going back several decades mostly assume that humanity has no resources outside of our home planet. But for as long as this debate has continued, there have been scientific theories about the true limits of human expansion, which include the entire universe and the entirety of time. This episode is inspired by a section of a book I'm reading called Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom. Uh, This is a 2014 book. It's an academic publication. And Nick Bostrom is a philosophy professor at Oxford University. He discusses the various implications of what he calls, as the title implies, superintelligence, which is simply a level of mental capacity beyond that of the human brain. Uh, The book goes into, you know, not just how superintelligence might be developed, but what the consequences might be, especially to a human species whose status as apex predator might be endangered by this. And I think this is probably prompted by, you know, the fact that there is so much going on in artificial intelligence right now. Um, I think we're still a long way from having, and there are several different types, several different ways this could happen, you know, by making a model of the human brain or going an entirely different direction or maybe having a superintelligence in a certain area, like social engineering, for example, hacking, medicine. I don't know. There's all kinds of things that um, different areas of intelligence. And he goes into this in the book. I, I think it's worth reading. It's a pretty dense reading, though. So not for the faint of heart when it comes to reading. But it's a bestseller. So quite a few people have read it, and it's definitely possible to read. Uh, so yeah, but it's uh, it's worthwhile. He does take a lot of time to um, you know talk about how this could happen as well, and, and the different types of super intelligence. So uh, it's a good read from that perspective too, if you're interested in neuroscience, which I am. One of the possible scenarios outlined is that um, that a world dominance by a super intelligent entity which Bostrom calls a singleton. Expanding this concept beyond Earth, Bostrom questions the ultimate reach of this dominance. Scientists have proposed many alternatives for the colonization of space, including one put forth by physicist Gerard K. O'Neill that involves living not on planets but in cylindrical habitats which spin, producing a centrifugal gravity. Uh, I actually saw a fictional depiction of this in the TV series The Expanse, in which a group of Mormons plan a 100-year voyage in a cylindrical spaceship. And basically, you walk on the inside of the cylinder. That's where the gravity is. So my goal, and possibly yours as well, 
it isn't everyone's, is to make my life last as long as possible, loving it all the way and live a happy, healthy, active life right up to the very end. This has moral and philosophical implications. Uh, I recently heard an episode of the podcast, Should This Exist?, which encourages scientists to think not just of how they should do something, but whether they should, and if so, how it should be done to encourage a positive use of the new technology. In that episode uh, was discussed whether there should be a limit to our lifespans. Is it responsible to live a longer life, given the impact on the rest of the world? Would it produce an elite group of extremely long-lived people who could afford this new technology, leaving the rest of us to live a to live shorter lives? Would the increased experience gained competence of these people put all others out of work? And the idea is not necessarily to discourage increasing longevity, but to increase our understanding of how best to deal with this increase in our society. Bostrom eventually turns the tables back to humanity, and I want to just read a quote that I think listeners to this show will find particularly engaging. Bostrom says, Assuming that the observable universe is void of extraterrestrial civilizations, then what hangs in the balance is at least 10 billion trillion 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 human lives. Though the number, the true number, is probably larger. If we represent all the happiness experienced during one entire such life, with a single teardrop of joy, then the happiness of these souls could fill and refill the Earth's oceans every second and keep doing so for a hundred billion billion millennia. It is really important that we make sure these truly are tears of joy. Which is the point of the book, being ready for superintelligence and handling it the right way. Sometimes it's good to take a 10,000 light year view of things instead of just figuring out what to have for breakfast and how to stay fit. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And uh, I want to say I really appreciate your feedback. Every bit of feedback is, is uh, valued by me. So be sure to send me your comments, mail at runningafever.com. And also you can comment, you can leave a review on iTunes if you wish. Really appreciate it. And uh, if you got the fever, keep it. And if you don't have it, go catch it. And I'll talk to you next time. I'm running a fever.